Okay, we are live. So um, Jared Davis is our um, presenter today. He's going to be talking about peace building through gardening. Jared is a pastor of the Center United Methodist Church in Sanford. He went to Duke in addition to NC State. I don't know why you don't have a Duke mug there, Jared. But, um, <laughs> and uh, he also is uh, the subcommittee chair for the Food, Agriculture, and Land Use. Um, uh, I got interrupted here with, um, okay, the North Carolina Conference this Church Creation Care Ministry. And I thought it was fascinating. He is connected to the land through his family farm, which was purchased on Christmas Eve in 1776. They go back a day or two in Wayne County. Without further ado, Jared, I'm going to stop my share. All right. Thank you very much. Um, very glad to be here with y'all uh, virtually. Um, so again, uh, my name is Jared Davis. I'm a pastor within the North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. And, um, and now I'm no longer the chair of a subcommittee. I'm chair of the entire committee, uh, a committee that oversees um, environmental stewardship and, and seeks to change that narrative. And that's, that's really um, where I'm coming from this morning is looking at, at land and how we use land and, and what we grow on the land and who we are benefiting with that land. Um, now this is, is a really huge topic and, and there's, there's no way that I can, can do it justice in the time that I have. Um, I, I encourage y'all, you know, let, uh, let, 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 let this be a launching point um, into whatever y'all are working on there in Nightdale and, and through the Rotary. Um, you know, I'm hoping to spark your imaginations and, and get some ideas flowing. But I want to, to really talk about land access and, and land use, not just with gardens, but with other things as well. Because in my experience, that's one of the most underutilized um, aspects of community development. You know, every community out there has land available. We just are, aren't sure what to do with it or how to get to it or who can get to it. Uh, and in, in my experience, a lot of times um, we, we approach things with a, what I call a field of dreams mentality. This idea that if we, if we just build something, then the people will come to it. And that's, that's problematic because, well, first off, it begins with the assumption that we know what people in need actually need. Right, we have this, this superiority complex that I can go into any community, I can look at it as an outsider and say, if I just put this here, that's going to solve all their problems. But over and over and over again, we've seen that that's, that's really not the case. When we approach any sort of community development, any sort of um, need-based health program, then we end up wasting a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money by giving people something that they don't need and that they don't want. And so if we talk about how to develop a community, how to, to bridge, um, bridge gaps and, and, and tear down barriers, then we need to start by looking at what a community actually needs. And so when I talk about community development, what I mean in this is helping a community to transition uh, from an externally dependent organization or group or network or community, whatever you want to call it, from externally dependent to internally sufficient. So it's not just uh, meeting an immediate need like providing one meal through a food shelter or through a food pantry or a soup kitchen or providing free flu shots or something like that. I'm talking about actually economically developing a group of people that moves them towards self-sufficiency and independence. And so that brings me back to land. Throughout history, access to land has been a major aspect of economic power in development and justice. Having access to land has always, always, always shaped a, purpose, a person's livelihood, what they're able to do with their life. And, and, and it's biblical. And it goes all the way throughout history 
Um, the idea of, of being led to a land is something that we do talk about in the Christian church and in, and in uh, Jewish synagogues as well. And in fact, in the book of Leviticus within the Bible, uh, there is a plan for how to provide for those in need. And it's not by giving them food, it's by allowing them access to the land, to come onto the land, to glean the fields, to take what they've harvested, not only to eat themselves, but to in turn sell it and be able to build up a life for themselves. But we as a society, we've somehow moved away from understanding the importance of access to land. See, our idea of success is no longer uh, a good farm. Our idea of success is a big yard, right? You have this big, nice house, big yard, and what do we grow in the yard? We grow grass. Like, why is that the measure of success? I don't know because I can't eat grass. I don't like it. I can't eat it. The only thing that grass does for me, because I don't have any kind of livestock, the only thing that grass does for me is give me another job to do, and I've already got enough on my plate. So why then do we grow so much grass? But everywhere I go, I see homes, I see businesses, I see churches, I see nonprofits, I see government buildings that are just surrounded by lush grass. And they spend thousands and thousands of dollars growing grass. And then they spend thousands and thousands of dollars cutting the grass. Just half a mile, if, if I were to leave my house and go that way, uh, not even half a mile away, there's this big field. It's at least five acres, if not more. It's got a big sign out front, future home of da 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 da. And I believe that this organization has every intention of building something there. But I've been here for going on five years and I haven't seen anything happen out in that field other than they cut it every once in a while. And so this big five acre field is sitting there growing weeds and brambles and blackberries and my honeybees like it, but it's not doing any good for my neighbors. It's not doing any good for the town that I'm living in. It's uh, Sanford, it doesn't do them any good here in Sanford. But every week a guy comes out there and cuts that grass. Uh, there's an organization out there called the Black Church Food Security Network, and uh, their founder, Heber Brown, Dr. Heber Brown, the brilliant man, had this realization a number of years ago that within these communities that his churches have been set in, there's not healthy food that's affordable for the people that he's working with, but there's always churches and they always have land. In fact, uh, Dr. Brown has said that the church as a whole, uh, church capital C, has more land than any other organization in the entire United States, and a vast majority of it is sitting there unused. Now, I'm, I'm talking about churches because that's, that's the, the area that I'm working in, but I know that that's not the only case. There are vacant lots in every town, in every community, Every local government owns some sort of a vacant lot. I promise you they do. You probably don't have to think very hard to know where the vacant areas are, the open areas are in your community. My point in all of this is that there is land out there and it's just not being used. Now it's also true that whoever owns the land and whoever makes decisions about the land might not be living in that community. The ones making those decisions aren't necessarily the ones who would benefit from those decisions. And so sometimes these things get overlooked because those who are, who are making the decisions, those who are, are in a position to change things, they don't see that change needs to be made. So what if then we as, as community organizers, as people that want to see our communities grow and prosper, what if we start looking at land stewardship as a viable option for our community development? Now, the most obvious example is, is through community gardens. And that is something that I, I have a, a huge stake in. I run a community garden. I work with other organizations that run their community gardens. And they can be great, but they're not without their problems. See, community gardens are, are, are pretty trendy right now. They're, they're kind of a fad. And they seem really, really cool. But I can tell you from firsthand experience that when you're out there on your knees pulling weeds in August, there ain't nothing cool about it. 
And it's in those times that people get frustrated and the people aren't showing up and, and aren't doing the work. Um, and those ideas that seem neat back in April and May have, have completely run out of steam. The other problem with community garden, it goes back to that field of dreams mentality. This idea that a community garden is the solution to all the problems. So as long as we put a community garden in that community, boom, we fixed hunger in that area, or we've engaged with the youth in that area or whatever it is. And that's simply not true. I'll give you an example, the town of Ahoski, if any of y'all have been there, town of Ahoski is, is um, it's a challenged town, economically speaking. And a number of years ago, they had this lot that was owned by the town. And there's this church that wanted to put a community garden on that lot. And so the town and the church collaborated together and they brought in the local health department and they got this community garden up and going and they developed with the health department something called, um, what is it? Farm, farm to school to home or something like that. No, farm to school to healthcare, that's what it is. Farm to school to healthcare. And through these partnerships, this develop, they developed this garden work that was putting kids out in the garden, was helping them know where their food came from, was putting healthy food into homes that needed it, was raising money for these kids and giving them opportunities to, um, to better their lives and to have uh, some kind of skill that they could carry either into the workforce or into their college. This is this great success. Neighboring town, one count, County over Murfreesboro. They saw this and they said, ha ha, this is working really good in a hosky. It can work here too. And so they looked around, they found this, this lot in the middle of a park and really a, a very low income area. And then they found a church and the church said, okay, we, we'll do a community garden there. And then they just turned it loose and said, all right, here's the lot, here's the church, go garden. And they saw no success from it. And so they, they, found a, another lady, a lady named um, Tina Watson. So they said, we want to know why this isn't working. You're from this area. You've had success in this area. Tell us why this isn't working. She literally went door to door in the neighborhood around this community garden and knocked on the door and said, I just want to know, what do you think of the community garden? And for the most part, she got two responses. That was either what community garden or you mean that garden none of us wanted? See, they hadn't done any sort of research. They hadn't considered, do the people living here want this? Will the people living here be benefited from this? They just said, oh, well, the, that town over there is doing it. And so we wanna do it too. And it's always tempting to, to try and emulate someone else's work, to see what's working, what's being successful elsewhere and try to do things here. But the problem is here is not there. Each community faces a unique challenge. Each community has its own needs, its own culture, its own personality. And when we see success, we want to, to imitate. Usually what we're seeing is just that surface. We're not seeing all that went into developing and bringing about that success. So instead of just saying, I want you to go out and plant a garden, I want you to instead think about your community and see what needs are there, but also see what six are not success, see what um, assets are there. So I'll give you a, a few more examples. I'll give you some, some negative examples. Let me give you some positive examples. My own uh, pet project, Selah Community Garden. Um, I'll be honest, we kind of started with a field of dreams mentality. Um, when, I, when I first arrived at my current church, um, they didn't give me much opportunity to, to get to know them and plan things out. They just said, all right, we hear you want to do this, go do it. Um, and so I, I kind of just jumped in, feet first, um, started this community garden, quickly realized that most of the people living in my community are elderly. Uh, the average age in about a five mile radius around my church is 69. Most of them retired, most of them living alone, very limited income. Nearly all of them have some sort of a health problem. And so we had this garden out here growing produce in that first year, we just gave all of our produce away. We still do, that's, that's our, our thing. We grow the produce and we literally give it away on Saturday mornings. 
but people were coming out to the produce stand, first of all, very suspicious because nobody gives anything away for free. But two, people were coming out to the produce stand and saying, oh, I used to garden, but I can't do it anymore. I can't bend over, my health won't allow me. Uh, last time I was in the garden, I fell, that sort of thing. And we also heard a lot of people saying, oh, I used to garden, but there's no point because now I'm living by myself and uh, just there's too much produce, I can't eat all of that. And so we started thinking, okay, well, if that's who is in our community and that's who we wanna benefit, what do we need to do? How can, we, how can we help them to help themselves? And so we started something called the Senior Seeds Health Initiative. We changed the way that we garden. We made it all 100% handicap accessible. We've got raised beds. We've got um, low threshold. We're all above ground where there's no till. Uh, we've got little carts that people can sit on and wheel themselves back and forth. We've got arbor tunnels that they can pick green beans without having to bend over. Um, we've done all this, this stuff so that they can garden safely. And the idea is to get our seniors into the garden. And in that way, we're meeting five needs that they have. All right. We're giving them physical exercise. I mean, just something as simple as piddling around in the garden is enough to, to keep people up and moving. We're allowing them social interaction with one another because so many of them are living by themselves and all they have to do during the day is sit there and watch TV. We're giving them mental stimulation because they're out there, they're helping to plan out the garden. They're figuring out, okay, what will grow where and when and, and how is it gonna be taken care of? We're giving them access to healthy food. Again, most of them are living on a fixed budget. A typical meal was something out of a can for them because that was very cheap, very easy, and there's just one person doing it. And finally, we're giving them the, the sense of giving back to the community, and that's incredibly important. Nobody wants to just take, 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 take. People want to give back. And so we've opened this up to the seniors. We are just finished our fourth year doing that, Senior Seeds. And we have just this core group of seniors that are out there every single week and they wouldn't miss it. I mean, these people are out there in, in the heat of the summer, they're out there in the rain, whatever, they're out there and we're seeing so many benefits to their bodies and to their minds. Plus we're seeing the community really start to get to know one another. People again, come out to our free produce stand and we even living within a mile of one another, they're meeting each other for the first time. They're getting to know each other. And I've seen firsthand where people who literally went to high school together and worked in the same place for decades haven't seen one another since retiring, even though they live in the same community and they're reconnecting out there in the garden and at the produce stand. And there are people that come and they take, again, people want to give back. And so we've got folks that bring eggs. We've got folks that bring flowers because that's what they're growing. We have one lady that knits dish rags and she brings those out there to give away. And so it might be a small thing, but to many of them, that's the biggest thing in their life is having an opportunity to one, get access to healthy food, but two, be a part of something. Get to know who their neighbors are and feel like they're giving back. And that's incredibly important. Now, there are plenty of other things out there that are going on that are much bigger than, than, than mine, much bigger than that community garden. And I'll tell you about a couple of them. One is called Working Landscapes. Now, this is up in Warrington. And the people that started Working Landscapes, they were looking at the community, looking at the health needs of children in their community. So, well, one of the biggest problems that we have is that our children are not getting healthy food. Okay, so where, what, what's the best healthy food that we can find? Well, it's locally grown produce. So they talk to their farmers. Most of the farmers in that area are same, uh, similar to most of the farmers around Nightdale, they're growing cash crops on the contract system. Things like tobacco, sweet potatoes, uh, corn, soybeans, cotton, those sort of things. They're not growing produce. And so the folks in Warrington talked to these farmers and said, well, why aren't you growing produce? They said, well, we, we can't sell it here. So we, we just, there, there's no market for it. I said, well, why can't you sell it to the schools? They said, I don't know, why can't we sell it to the schools? 
And so then they went and they talked to the schools and the schools, they asked them, well, why aren't you buying this produce? They said, oh, well, we can't buy the produce because there is no produce to buy. So, okay, well, look, if we can get these guys growing produce and we can get y'all buying produce, then we can get healthy food to these kids. And so they started looking into, okay, can we actually do this? And then they found out, well, in order for the schools to buy it, uh, it has to be processed in a very specific way. You know, there's, there's all these guidelines and regulations, has to be processed in a very specific way. And the farmers can grow it, but they can't process it. They don't have the means. And so this group said, okay, if we get the farmers to grow the produce, and if we get someone to process it, can y'all at the school level, can y'all buy this and feed this to our kids so they can be healthier? School said yes. And so this group went out, they bought a, an abandoned restaurant. And they went in, they cleaned up the, the commercial kitchen there. They got some unskilled laborers from the community, folks that were without a job because it was a rundown, impoverished uh, county. They trained them in how to process. They got contracts with these farmers that they were going to start growing produce, that had a contract with the school that they're going to start buying this produce. And now they've been able to partner with the schools, partner with the farmers. They're benefiting the county economically. They're getting money into the economy, not only with the farmers, but they're also paying their laborers there in the processing facility. They're able to rent out their processing facility to uh, other local entrepreneurs. They're teaching classes on um, cottage industry and how to start your own small business. They're getting healthy food into the mouths of children. And they've got so much extra produce now that they're able to get it into the homes uh, of kids that otherwise might not have food outside of school. And so it took a lot of work and it still takes a lot of work. And it took a lot of creativity and it still takes a lot of creativity, but they're seeing a large amount of success in meeting that initial goal that they would not have seen if they just said, all right, kids need healthy food, boom, here's some healthy food, take it and run with it. No, they're engaging with the land, they're engaging with the community, they're engaging with one another and developing uh, where they are. Tell you one more, um, organization called Growing Change is in Scotland County. Uh, Norrin Sanford is the man that started this. I met him about a year and a half ago. And he was a social worker there in Scotland County. And Scotland County is not, um, is not where you would want to live. We'll just put it that way. It's uh, ranked 98th in healthy living in North Carolina as of 2015. Um, not a good place to live. High crime rate, uh, recognized as the most violent county in all of North Carolina. And as a social worker, he was seeing a lot of kids, high school age kids, who were basically being thrown aside. They would get into trouble and they would get sent to juvie and they would just spiral downward. He said, I think I can, I think I can solve this. He said, I can put these kids to work, keep them out of the system, put them to work farming sustainably, learning a trade, they can sell their crops, make money. They can get a degree while doing this. He said, all I need in order to do this is land. And so he looked around, what land is out there? What's, what's available? And he found in Scotland County, an abandoned prison. And these prisons, they're all over North Carolina. They're the, they're the old work camps that we don't use anymore. You might have one close to you. I have to go back and research it what's near uh, Nightdale. But he said, look, there's this abandoned prison work camp just sitting there. It's owned by the local government. They're not doing anything with it. What can we do with it? And so he started growing change and they started flipping this prison, bringing these kids that would have spent a good chunk of their lives in prison if they had kept on the road that they were going. He said, we're gonna change prison into opportunity. They started planting crops, they grow lettuce hydroponically, they've got beehives, they've got sheep, they've got donkeys, they've got all kinds of stuff. And they've partnered with um, veterans who have returned and are looking for opportunities. They partnered with UNC Pembroke and these kids that were on the precipice of being lost in the system, they've been able to bring in there and give them opportunity and change their lives 
and benefit not only the kids, but these veterans, and the community, and so many others. So all of that to say, um, having access to land, seeing land for the opportunities it provides, that gives us who want to benefit our community a great, great, great opportunity that otherwise would be lost. And so I want you to just consider it, whether it's a garden or whether it's trying to, to you know, bring kids out of the prison system or get uh, kids healthy food or provide health opportunities for your seniors or whatever it is, what land is near you? What needs are near you? And how can these things be brought together? Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, that's all that I've prepared. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, I, let's open it up for questions. We've got sheep, donkeys, beehives, and um, all kinds of good produce here. Oh, it's a quiet Wednesday with this group. Good grief. OK, so um, if no one else has a question, I'll see if I can come up with one. Um, so obviously, community assessment is really important. Right. Um, we are, uh, I would say, predominantly a bedroom com community of Raleigh. Um, so different than a very rural setting, which may be more um, uh, of the situation that you identified in your examples. But if you were us starting to do a community assessment, how would you begin? So uh really uh, you, what you want to look at is what assets are already there what's going on what's happening so talk to um talk to the people that not only live in the area but the people that are working in the area i, I do i actually used to live near nightdale um off of grasshopper road if any of y'all know where that is um and so you're right like in some ways it is a bedroom community um but i promise you that that if you dig a little bit deeper, and it's not going to take much, you're going to see like beyond those that are commuting into Raleigh or, or into RTP every day. Um, there are quite a few people around Nightdale um, that aren't able to do that, aren't able to live that kind of life. And so <clears throat> talk to your local law enforcement, talk to your local government, talk to your local churches, um, any kind of a civic organization that's already in there and see where they're working and what's already being done. You know, there, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, if there's already a group that's in there, a church or, or whoever it is meeting a, a need, find out how they're meeting that need and then find out how you can partner with them. Um, nobody is meeting every need. Uh, so yeah, start, start with that. Start with looking for who's already in there, who's working, and, and then literally just get to know people. Um, you know, find out where where are the people who live here? Where are they working? Where are they hanging out? What are they doing after work? Um, if, if it kind of depends on what area you want to um, focus on, but you know, sometimes you can do something as simple as, as walk through a neighborhood and talk to people, greet people, um, especially right now with COVID, people aren't all over the place. They're, they're in their homes. And, and I know here in my neighborhood, I've seen more people walking the last few months than I've ever seen before. Um, so yeah, just get out there, talk to people, find out what's already going on, and um, don't assume that you know already. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have any other questions? Jared, we are a quiet group today. I'm not right. entirely certain why, but uh, and it's not like we've changed the uh, times thing yet. But uh, in any case, we would like to thank you for your time. And um, actually, I'm not sure I shared the right screen. Do you guys see a certificate? All right, yay, I did it right. Okay, so we will give you, Jared, a, a virtual certificate of appreciation and thanking you for um, your presentation to the Rotary Club today. And um, as I have your contact information, if we have follow-on questions, we may be in touch, but we very much thank you for your time. And we know that you have another meeting. You're welcome to stay here if you'd like, but if you need to go on to your next thing, feel free to jump off.
Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And yeah, like you said, you've got my contact information. So if anyone does have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Great. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you.